First, I know one of the intentionally omitted items in the budget, in this budget bill, was relative to uh, special housing units or segregated units in correctional facilities. Uh, is that uh, permanently omitted, or is that something that's going to come back up later on in one of the other budget bills? Uh, we will not be seeing that later on today, tonight. Okay, great. Um, I wanted a couple questions that kind of I want to ask you, just to see if you have any idea, and then I'll promise I'll get back to why I'm. I'll bring it back sure. to that point. But you would agree that contraband in our our correctional facilities is a problem that needs to be addressed with one way or another, wouldn't you agree? Drugs getting into our prisons that inmates are getting their hands on? You know, I, I think it's a continuing issue that okay. DOCS uh, addresses on a daily basis. Do you know what, in 2013, how many uh, seized contraband items we had? No, I, I couldn't tell you the answer to that question. About 2,712. And in 2017, it had 4,124, or 66%. Isn't that a significant increase? Would you agree with that? Of drugs being inbound in our prisons and inmate possessions and stuff. That, isn't, that, isn't that a serious issue that we have to address? Wouldn't you agree? I, you know, I don't have the luxury of having the, the data that you're referring to, so I really couldn't comment on it. Fair enough. In this budget bill, is there any dollars to help, the sto to help stop the flow of contraband getting into our prison, whether it's technology or screening, whether it's the use of more drug dogs or a, a, a mail vending program to stop drugs getting into our facilities. Do we have anything in this budget that will help stop uh, drugs getting into our prisons? We don't add anything uh, in this budget. There are uh, procedures that DOCS currently has in, in place to try and identify contraband coming in. Yeah, because even, even according to DOCS own numbers, the, the, the number of positive drug tests happening. In 2017, they t did random drug tests over 84,000 inmates, and 5,500 5, of them, or 6.51 percent of those, tested positive for drug use in the prison. So that's a problem. And contraband's getting into our prisons that we need to address. And that's why, hopefully, obviously, we're not seeing more resources in this budget for that. We see it for other things, but not for this. I think that's problematic. Um, now, this language of this particular bill says up to two prisons. And, and I know probably when you were negotiating this, you said, well, we're going to save a third prison, so we'll give the governor the two prisons for 90 days instead of making them. So you're probably thinking we'll save one prison by doing that negotiation, correct, when you were doing it? Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the answer, Mr. Barkley, the, originally the discussion was two, two prisons. Right. Uh, we went to the 90 days instead of the right of six? 90 days, it was 60. It was 60 originally, we added the extra 30 days, uh, though there is, a, we will be seeing a chapter amendment to this in the revenue bill that says up to three, but we've been uh, told that it, they're looking at two during this year, but they wanted the authority for the third. So we're basically looking at three prison closures. So before the ink was, ink was even dried on two, this. Two, two. We the give the authority for three, but we've been told to. Right. Two, well, before four. the ink was even dried on this, we right. already gave the governor what he wanted from the get-go. And instead of giving him right now, you say, so now you give him a 90-day window. Wouldn't you admit when there's a prison closure, it's devastating to a local community for those people who have to be relocated or lose their jobs. In and of itself, it's a devastation to a local community. I know you, you're, people, people say it's not a jobs program, but you have to admit when a prison closes in a community, it's devastating to that community. Wouldn't you not agree? There, we're, we're being told that there would not be a loss of, that people, there would not be a loss of, of jobs as a result of this in that people could transfer to other, other positions. There's a, uh, a tremendous amount of attrition that happens on an annual basis in the prison, in the dock system, so that uh, but a prison people will not lose People have opportunities to, to stay within the docks as a docks employee. I understand they always say that no one's going to lose a job, but a prison closing in a community is devastating to that community, is it not? Well, there, I, there are commitments that when prisons close, the, uh, they have to look at alternative uses for that facility, and that is what has happened in, in some other areas. Right. I still have a, a shock facility in my, in my district from several years ago that they haven't done anything with, they can't do anything with. So it's devastating to that community. 
Can you not agree that a prison closure in a community is devastating to that particular community? Yes or no? No. Uh, you know, I think when any employer and any employer in a community closes, it's going to impact. Exactly. It will have an impact, and the question is, do we want? That's why there's exactly. a desire to find alternative uses for these for these facilities, and uh, you know, understanding that there is an impact. In so the we community. know the governor wanted to close three prisons at the beginning. You guys agreed to two at the be in the middle, and then we've already added it up to three. So instead of a normal uh, process now we have for a prison closure would be right. one year notification, right? Under current law. Right. But this makes it 90 days. So now, not only are you disrupting a community by taking away a facility, now for those families who might not lose a job but might have to move six hours away, instead of having a year to prepare for it, you're saying you only have 90 days to prepare for it. So not only is it, insult, is it an insult, you're adding insult to the injury of the closure and not giving the families the time they need to adjust with that transformation. So now we're just saying, giving the governor exactly what he wanted from the get-go, before the ink even dried on, on the two, we caved and gave them another prison. In 90 days, they could close these things down, which will be devastating to that community, will be devastating to that family, correct? Wouldn't you agree? That's going to be devastating to that community and devastating to that family. Had to deal with that all within a 90-day period rather than at least a year to deal with it, right? Um, yes, it's harder 90 days versus a year. Sure. This isn't something new, uh, new and unique. We have done this before. Uh, and, you know, we, we do know that, you know, that there, it, it has an impact. I would agree that not everybody can relocate, even if they're given the opportunity to do so. You know, but I would just restate what I said earlier to Mr. Barkley. There are approximately 10,000 empty beds in the New York State prison system. We're paying to keep these facilities open with empty beds. Uh, so, you know, we're spending needed state resources on maintaining these empty beds that we don't need, and clearly the, the trend is going down. Does, Doing does, nothing will end up with more empty beds. Does this budget do anything to eliminate and end uh, the dangerous practice of double bunking and double selling? Because I know you mentioned 10,000 beds. We know there's nearly 7,000 right now active top beds in the system. So does this budget do anything to eliminate the dangerous practice of double bunking and double selling, which we, we know is inhumane for inmates? It's used in maximum security prisons. It's used in medium security prisons. Is there anything to eliminate the double bunks and double cells in this budget present proposal, or are we just taking the, the closures and saying that's it? Yeah. Right. We we think uh, that they. Uh, by the way, we think that they are looking at uh, medium uh, medium prisons, which have the most uh, empty beds, and in medium prisons there are. Uh, 3,000, uh, right now a total of 3,189 double bunk beds. And some of the reason why they keep the, the double uh, bunk, it's really not a, a permanent fixture. They, they want to keep a certain number of beds empty in any given facility, uh, have, have a certain number of beds available. As soon as the bed becomes available, the inmate leaves the, the top bunk, and the top bunk is only on the the far end of uh, the dormitory style uh, prisons. Do we know what type of facilities we're looking, look at the governor's looking to close? Maximum security That's, facilities, medium, uh, shock uh, facilities, oh, right. which ones? We, we think they're medium, but we haven't, uh, it hasn't been 100% confirmed. Okay. And those are the, as I said, those are, they have over uh, almost 4,400 empty empty beds in the in medium facilities in our state. I want to ask you another question. Uh, another issue, I talked about the drug use in our prisons, is the violence that's occurred in our prisons. Do you know how much from since 2013, when these prison closures have been going pretty ongoing, from 2013, what the increase in assaults, inmate on inmate, uh, inmate on staff assaults has increased from 2013 to 2018? Uh, I don't know that number, but why don't I just talk about this past year, there were 1,033 assaults committed by inmates against staff in, in 2018. 
Uh, of that 1,033, 1,019 of them involved no injuries at all. Uh, the classification of an assault in prison is different than what most people uh, think of as assault under the uh, general, uh, under the penal law. 33, I mean 303 of, of those assaults were classified as minor, meaning a, a scratch or a, a bruise. Uh, an assault can be throwing a cup at a cup, a, a cup at an officer without any. That's what a lot of uh, you know, or, or touching without that injury. And there were only 11 assaults that required actual medical uh, treatment. Well, from 2013 to 2018, assaults, inmate on staff assaults have increased from 645 to 973, or over 50 percent. I know you said that, well, that could just be someone throwing a cup, but it can also be an inmate spitting. It can also be an inmate throwing feces on a corrections officer, an inmate exposing themselves. That's the type of thing that happens. Those are assaults that are going on. Also, inmate on inmate assaults are up from 767 to 1164, or up over 50 percent. So this has all happened since these prison closures have all started. It's created a power keg environment in our facilities. Madam uh, uh, Chairwoman, thank you very much for your sure. time. Mr. Speaker, on the bill. On the bill, sir. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues, I'm very, very frustrated by this prison closure plan. You know, when I saw there was two prisons, I think I could understand the thinking might be, well, you know what, we'll save one of the facilities. But before the ink's even dried on this bill, you already came into this governor and given him what he wants again to allow for a third prison closure. And instead of allowing, if you just went through the normal process, at least those families in those communities and those facilities would at least have a year to plan for that, a whole year. But now they're going to be told to up and move and relocate in 90 days if they have to go to another facility. This governor wants to take credit for the number of prisons he's closed during his tenure, but he has failed to take responsibility and credit for the powder keg environment that he has created in our correctional facilities. I have just gave you the statistics from 2013 to 2018. Inmate on staff assaults are up over 50 percent. Inmate on inmate staff, inmate on inmate assaults are up over 50 percent as well. And then before we even look to close down one correctional facility, we should be first eliminating the dangerous practice of double bunking and double selling inmates. We know there's over thousands of beds and there are 7,000 uh, double bunks and double cells in our facilities. Why not get rid of those first? Because there is a pressure cooker environment going into this, these facilities. With the policies that this administration continues to implement with the prison closures, uh, looking to restrict the use of shoes, um, special housing units, uh, looking to uh, stop a mail vendor program that stops keeping the drugs from coming into our facilities, not deploying drug dogs in our correctional facilities, reclassification of dangerous prisoners from maximum security facilities to medium security facilities. Drugs are running rampant in our, in our correctional facilities. It's created a very dangerous environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I see oftentimes uh, one of our corrections officers is being assaulted or beaten or spit at or have feces thrown at them. Stuff like that happens daily in our prisons. And we're not sh showing them that we have their back. You know, this body always says they stand up for our unions. Well, here we have some unions that are corrections officers. And instead, at least pushing back on this administration, saying enough is enough, we give him a, a carte blanche 90 days to close down any prison you want. If we at least would have pushed back and said, no, we're not going to accept this prison closure, he still could have done it, but it would have had to take a year-long process instead of 90 days. Now we know when a prison closes in a community, it's, it's devastating to that local community. It's devastating to that family. Yes, they might have another job available for them, but that job might be six hours away, and they might have to uproot their families and relocate 90 days now versus a year. This is, an, this is adding insult to injury to our brave men and women who work in our correctional facilities doing a very dangerous job, my colleagues. I don't understand the rationale behind it, rationale behind it but this administration, as much as they want to keep boasting about the prisons are closing, they have to take ownership with the rise in violence that's going on in our corrections facilities because of the powder keg, dangerous environment they're creating with their policies and with these closures. For this reason and for many others, I'm going to be voting that no on this bill, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. I would like to direct my comments tonight 
to the brave men and women who work at our state correctional facilities, our corrections officers and other staffs. I'm sorry because this budget fails you big time. Our budget should be about saying something and showing that we have your back. Unfortunately, instead, this budget with these closures is more like a knife in your back. It's just plain wrong. I just want to say to all of you corrections officers who are out there, thank you for all you do for us to keep us safe. Each and every day you go into a dangerous job and you don't know what to expect or what's going to happen. And I want you to know, I believe there's a number of good people here in state government that appreciate you and thank you for what you do for us. But unfortunately and obviously, with this budget and these prisoner cl prison closures, I just don't think there's enough. For that reason, I'm voting in the negative.